Welcome to Discovering. Tonight we talk about rainbow smelt, particularly in Lake Superior, and they're not really doing that well. And there was a time in the 80s and 90s when lake trout were still in the process of recovering when there was pretty phenomenal smelt fisheries. Plus, we get a history lesson on the Menominee watershed, talking about the old lumber drives and some good fishing holes they have left for us here today. What we're looking at here is the, the uppermost dam on the Brule River. So sit back and relax. It's Monday night and it's time for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a longtime lover of northern Michigan. When the old timers say things aren't the same as they used to be, they're not wrong. And in this case, it's regarding the tradition of smelt dipping or more widely known as smelting. Some recall the days where you could easily net unlimited amounts in minutes. Now it may take a bit of patience, luck, or serious effort to get your two gallon daily limit. So where did all the smelt go? For some answers on the smelt population on Lake Superior, I visited the research vessel Kayai to talk to Dan Yule, a fisheries research scientist of the Great Lakes Science Center of the United States Geological Survey. Rainbow smelt are uh, an invasive species to Lake Superior. They're native to the uh, east coast of North America. They fawn their way into the Great Lakes because they were intentionally stocked in a small lake called Crystal Lake, which is near Frankfurt, Michigan, in the year 1910. That lake is very close to Lake Michigan, and by 1930 they had escaped and become part of the fish community in Lake, Lake Michigan by 1930. And by about mid-1935, they were discovered in Lake Superior. What happened is, is they uh, sort of came into the system at a period when uh, we were starting to have real problems with the lamprey uh, invading the lake, which really devastated uh, native predators in Lake Superior and, and in the other Great Lakes as well. With the lack of predators, there was like a perfect situation for rainbow smelt to expand rapidly during the 1950s and 60s. And they really remained at relatively high levels through the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, around in the 50s, uh, efforts to start to control these sea lamprey were implemented and slowly those led to the rehabilitation of lake trout. Uh, with increasing lake trout numbers has come more predation on rainbow smelt and we've seen a dampening or a lowering of their overall population levels in the lake which has been promoted by the successful rehabilitation of the native predator. Every five years we conduct what's called the Coordinated Science and Monitoring Initiative or CSMI survey which is funded by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And in that survey, we did uh, lake-wide uh, at 56 sampling sites across the lake. Uh, we estimated smelt abundance in Lake Superior at a half a billion uh, smelt. The last time we had done the survey prior to 2022 was 2016. And during that survey, we estimated the abundance at about one billion. So that represents about a 50% decline from 2016 to 2022. It's been sort of a declining trend since the 1970s when that survey started. There's been some oscillation where they would come back a little bit, but in general, the trend is downward. And we see now uh, more age one and age two fish and fewer of the larger age three and age four fish.
Dan says the reduced smelt population isn't a cause for concern yet, and their smaller numbers are actually helping native prey fish to rebound. And this last year, during the 2022 CSMI survey, we saw amazing high densities of native fish. So I don't know if it's cause and effect, but I can say that uh, native fish are, have done a phenomenal job of recruiting last year, and it happens to coincide temporarily with the smelt numbers being really low. Is it causal? I can't say for certain, because rainbow smelt are known to be a known predator of native prey fish, including cisco and bloater in Lake Superior, where they will eat the larvae of those fish because they're a perfect size for them. Rainbow smelt make up 70% of the diet of lake trout. So it's interesting to us, but although smelt numbers are greatly reduced from where they had been, we have not yet seen any negative consequence to lake trout. Uh, that is, uh, growth rates seem to be static or relatively constant over the last 15 or 20 years, uh, indicating that those predators are still able to find uh, enough smelt to continue to grow at the rates that they did in the past. If there's any change in that, I think then uh, maybe we will have more concerns about rainbow smelt from the standpoint that they are such an important component of the diet of those lake trout, uh, particularly the smaller lake trout that we have in Lake Superior. So, no concern yet, but let it be known that we're monitoring the situation carefully. Even though smelt numbers are low, I did see on Facebook where some people were highly successful this season. The one night I went out to find some smelt, there were only 30 caught. Next year, I'll have to put more time and effort in. While we're on the topic of smelt, there is also a consumption advisory on these tasty little fish. Our advisory is to no more than one meal per month. That corresponds to about an eight ounce serving. Uh, for adults and then for children, um, smaller around two to four ounces um, based on um, age and weight. Advisory for smelt in Lake Superior was first released in March of 2021. This was actually based on data that was shared with us from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources um, from smelt that they collected over by the Apostle Islands. And those smelt um, had elevated levels of PFOS that were detected. Um, Wisconsin issued a one meal per month advisory for those smelt from Lake Superior, but knowing that we didn't have any data on PFOS levels and smelt of our own, um, we worked with our partners at the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, or EGLE, um, and they ended up getting several different samples of smelt from uh, as far west as Union River and 14 Mile Point near Ontonagon, um, as far east um, as Whitefish Bay. Those results from our own testing and our own processes uh, resulted in similar levels to what Wisconsin had found in their smelt over by the Apostle Islands. Um, so still uh, corresponding with that advisory of one serving per month that we issued. To learn more about what these chemicals are, I talked to Summer Streets, an expert on PFAS. PFAS is an acronym that stands for PER and polyfluoroalkyl substances, and they're a class of several thousand compounds that are persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic. And they're used in just a huge array of consumer and industrial items and processes. They're really kind of everywhere. PFOS is a PFAS, a type of PFAS, a single chemical. It's perfluorooctane sulfonate. And it's a compound that um, was produced up through 2002. And then there was some phase out. And so it's not supposed to be produced in the United States anymore, but it still is in some products. Many ways PFAS and PFOS can enter the water. But once it's there, any of the fish that interact with a contaminated area will bioaccumulate the PFOS. It's not just smelt. We find PFOS in many species. Smelt have this reputation of being a very clean fish. They're small. Um, what we what we thought we knew about fish was that, you know, these chemicals that build up, the larger the fish, the more chemicals they're going to have. And then the smaller fish are going to have lower levels. With PFOS, we haven't really seen that trend so far, and it's not really clear why. We just have to do, we just have to do some more research, and it's an, it's an ongoing question. The, the purpose of our guidelines is not to discourage people from eating fish completely. It's not to scare people into, you know, swearing off fish entirely. Um, it's just to keep people informed, to give them information that they can use, you know, to inform their own risk um, and make their, make their own decisions about how much fish, which fish to eat. 
It sounds like there is hope for the future of being able to consume more smelt. You know, if we can stop production of PFAS, I think that will be tremendously helpful. If we can work on managing our current sources so that we're preventing release into the air and land and water in the first place, that will go a long way to protecting our fishing resources. Fish have a special trick that other animals don't have and that they seem to be able to get rid of or depurate their PFAS loads relatively quickly once they're removed to clean water, which I think is really hopeful because then when you cut off the source, the concentration of PFAS in the fish will start to decline relatively rapidly so that within a few years, you can really have a better picture in terms of fish health and human consumption of fish. A good reminder, we need to take care of our land and water so we can eat clean fish for years to come. I learned a lot more from these two than I was able to fit into this show, so I put their full interviews on my website, discovertheup.com. If you grew up in the UP, you're familiar with images from the late 1800s of men standing on pine logs in the middle of a river, driving them down to wading sawmills. These log driving activities forever altered the characteristics of these rivers, and not just negatively. I got a tour of a few sites on the Menominee River watershed, one of the largest pine log transport systems where over 10.5 billion board feet of lumber were floated up to 160 miles by water. My tour guide is retired fisheries biologist Bill Ziegler, who paddled all of the watershed looking for remnants of our lumbering past. Back then, the only transportation was by water. And as a fish biologist, that's how I got interested in and it, and it is, is because of the impact that it has on, on trout today. Especially the, what we see, the habitat structures that are created here that are still here. The different logging companies, a Nelligan was one of them, a Cook was another one. There were a lot of different companies, but they operated on these tributaries. They would get the logs to the tributary and they, they were responsible to flush the logs down that tributary, whether it be the Brule, or the paint, or the Michigami, or, or the fence, or the deer, or all these other streams in the watershed. And the idea was to get them to a certain point uh, for this upper watershed. It was to get them down by the falls that's now inundated by the Brule Island or Paint Pond Dam by a certain point, I think it was May 1st. And then from there on, a collective company, they didn't cooperate at all on these other rivers, but a collective company called the Menominee Boom Company would take the logs and run them all together, all the different companies, collecting them as they went all the way down to the, to the mouth at the city of Menominee. We reportedly at the high point supported 30 sawmills. In the 1890s, I think this was reportedly was the biggest uh, pine logging operation in the world for, of its day and it run by the, the collective group called the Menominee Boom Company. So the purpose of the dams was to provide enough water to flush them downstream. At high water, they would, they would put, throw them in, into the river with the backup water and then flush them through downstream. And they, they had to, to put enough head of water into the stream with the dam here and then some other dams. But the, these dams on the Brule were every I don't know whether they were every five or ten miles. They were originally set up at choke points where the dams were either super shallow areas that they had to flush them through, or sometimes rapids, or areas where the dams, where the logs were likely to get jammed up. <laughs> what we're looking at here is the the uppermost dam on the Brule River, and it's classic in terms of if you were coming along trying to decide what was it is. It has all of the features. It, it's hard to see right now with the lighting, but the framework is all there and the, all the timbers and there's a lot of, there'll be some iron spikes. And then uh, there's the, the backwater area that it's still holding back a little bit of water upstream, but mostly the plunge pool downstream where when they sluice the logs through, it eroded out a very deep hole. It's, it comes from flushing thousands of logs through these dam and high, the, this ultra high water and it scours out the scour pool, scours out the gravel and, and sand 
from the area below and, and actually widens it out as you can see. And you came up with a, a, a pool that could be anywhere, you know, it might be 12 feet deep or so, and especially good for holding some larger fish if brown trout happen to be available, which they are here in the Brule, and, uh, and also brook trout as well. This dam was probably created in the 1870s or 1880s, and it created a trout hole, and that trout hole is still good today. Right now we're at the Pentoga Dam, which is on the Brewer River. We would have passed over two dams to get down to this, two other old historical logging dams, just upstream of Saunders Dam and then farther upstream by Ski Brule is the Wheeler Dam. This is a fairly uh, good trout fishing hole here at Seasonally. And uh, you know, you can see the, the remnants of a fairly good size earth and berm. But a lot of times this is what, you know, we just find a few timbers and this. There's a few places on the Net River where we didn't have a really good plunge pool, but we had a really definite berm and, and a couple of timbers and that's it. But you, you don't see any wooden structure here, just the earth and berm and the, and the obvious plunge pool. It's, it's pretty unusual to have, a, have had a good long running logging dam and not have a plunge pool that uh, you know that ends up being a good trout hole in the in the meantime and i'm not trying to be say that logging was good for all the trout streams but f for the most part you know intuitively a lot of people would just think that it was always bad and in this case there were a few ca few examples of where it was where it's created good trout habitat that is here today and and remains good and didn't fill in right now we're at a on the Deer River at the remnants of a one called Splash Dam. And this is the most intact of them. But for our purposes today, unfortunately, a beaver has, has taken where the old washout is and has buttressed its dam up against the old logging dam. We saw that, I saw that a lot as I went around, is where the beaver just used the man-made uh, logging dam to to make to make their dam there to be able to hold the dam where they might not have their beaver pond is flooding a lot of the hardware structure that we were hoping to see here luckily my old photo will show some of that but you can see the the rock cribbing and some of the tow pilings have washed away in the last 10 years or so but but there used to be a lot of 45 degree angle tow pilings but you can see across the way it's a real high bank so see what they did is they picked a spot where they didn't have to make a half mile long berm to constrict it. This is one where there isn't a really good plunge pool below, but there was a really good backwater area. And, it, and there's enough dam here, it still holds a backwater area to be able to, to be a fishing spot seasonally. The Deer River gets too warm in the hot part of the summer to the trout have to move to more spring areas. but. But this can be a, is a pretty good spot at times. The beaver dam wasn't the only surprise we had on our tour. Well, what we're looking at is actually unfortunately washed out boat landing at Bone Lake, which is a state boat landing technically. Here, the remnants are underwater right now, but the, one of the landowners put the rocks in there under DEQ permit, but, but to maintain the water level so you could still have a boat landing here. And unfortunately, the ramp is, is gone. The neat thing about those logs is there's, if you look around on a lot of them, there'll be chains and eye bolts and things that they use to kind of corral the logs with the log booms. Well, they were logs that, still, that they were using as structures and they, ha they had all these chains in them and they, they probably weren't using valu real valuable logs. There's examples of this at Fence Lake in Barriga County. There's examples of this at uh, Upper Holmes Lake and Lower Holmes Lake in Northwest Iron County. There's, there's examples of these boom logs where they are left in the water or more than hundred years later, they're still here. So you can see some of the timbers and structures to the old logging sluicing dam that was here and the plunge pool that is typical at most of them. And the boat landing is just on the old berm for the dam and 
You can see the berm right over there where the private land begins. It's an interesting look at our past and present. Thank you, Bill, for the tour and history lesson. That's all for tonight, and I hope to see you right back here next week for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.